following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick, and you're listening to Matt Slick Live. Today is January 22nd, 2024. If you want to give me a call, please do. Just dial 877-207-2276. And uh, what can we talk about? All kinds of stuff. So, um, as always, you know, I was on on the weekend. uh, On Saturday night, I spent some time witnessing. On Sunday night, I spent some time witnessing. I met a Catholic who's very knowledgeable. Uh, I was really surprised. I don't rarely meet him that knowledgeable. And he was rude at first. I pointed it out, but then he he, he was good after that. But um, uh, he was was saying how the Catholic Church teaches the same thing we do biblically and pointed out that it wasn't the case. But it was a good conversation. Nevertheless, if you you were by any chance there listening, because the room was full of people, then uh, please call and uh, give me your feedback on that. And if not, no big deal. And if you want, you can email me at 877. <laughs> you can email me. Let's try it again. You can email me at info at karm.org, info at karm.org. And in the subject line, just put in there, um, you know, a radio question or radio comment, and I can get to that. And if you want to call me, that's easy to do. It's uh, 877-207-2276. And uh, let's see. I'm going to check my calendar because, 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 uh, because of the wonderful things. Okay. Uh, let's see. On um, February, I'm making sure, yep, February 10th, I'll be in Sandy, Utah, speaking uh, at nine o'clock in the morning at the um, uh, Mormonism Research Center that is established by MRM. So it's in Sandy, uh, Utah. I'll be there staying with uh, Bill McKeever and um, getting down there with Eric and stuff on a Saturday. So, hey, you know, if uh, you guys are in the area and you want to come by, uh, then uh, that's all you got to do. You got to just check it out. Now that I'm thinking about it, uh, let's see, mrm.org. And uh, Bill and Eric, they do great. They do great stuff there. And uh, I'm looking for it to find in there the center where the address is and stuff. I'll, I, I haven't looked there for a while. I just, I just know where it is. So I'll get the address and stuff like that. But um, so you can, you know, I'm curious. Maybe someone can find it for me. Put it in the uh, the chat text in a thing here. I'm just looking podcast video they get a lot of good stuff there it's a good nice site it really is it looks good so uh oh i have debate i do wednesday let's see what what's happening wednesday let's see on the trinity it's okay so i'll be debating the trinity see, i do these things and uh, and then <laughs> sometimes <laughs> sometimes i you know because i'm so busy i do so many things it's like Somebody says, are you ready for the debate? What debate? Tonight. <laughs> what time? <laughs> they go, in an hour. I go, what are we debating? We're debating that, oh, okay, that's right, okay. Well, yeah, I'll prep. And so get in there and do that. Uh, so uh, oneness debate, two on two. Actually, it's going to be different. This is going to be different because Andrew Rappaport, I've known Andrew for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I guess. And he's an apologist also, and he and I are going to be debating uh, the oneness issue. I don't know how it's going to work. Now, this is what I normally do when there are other people involved in a debate, uh, you know, like a tag team, two on two. What I often do is just not say a whole bunch. Uh, Not because, you know, I'm pouting, you know, it's just, you know, just see what they're going to say. And if they need some backup or some help, that's how I view it sometimes, you know. Or even if I need backup or help, you know, I mean, certainly it would be the case. But uh, that'll be that. So, um, oh, now they want to know where. So it'll be, oh, let's see. 
Oh man! Oh, boy, nice, nice yawn. I'm gonna put it in there. I'm gonna put it in there, and I'm gonna put it right there. So there, I put the URL in. I gotta put it. Maybe somebody, Joanne, will uh, put it up on the. Um, the we need the Carm calendar, like it's an actual calendar thing. We gotta do that. Well, I know we have one. But anyway, so. Uh, Open mic discussion. Oh, that's what's going to be. Open mic discussion, back and forth. Is the Jesus? Is Jesus the Father? This is going to be so easy. To it's going to be so easy. I can prove Jesus is not the Father. It's very easy to do. I can do it in one minute or less. Seriously, done. The problem isn't that. The problem is that uh, the unbelievers. <laughs> it doesn't work, and. Uh, so I have to tell them, no, it does work. No, it doesn't. And so then it becomes uh, one of those, you know. And um, so that's what it is. Yeah, I, we'll be just debating about little um, particulars. So I'm gonna, all I'm going to do, all I'm going to do is just give a really good, solid, quick argument. It'll be quick and slick. Now, depending on, on if Andrew goes first, you know, and I, I don't really, I don't mind. I, you know, it's like, go first. I don't care. Go first. Um, I do impromptu debates all the time, so it's not a big deal. Let's see. It'll be on YouTube. And which ministry? Oh, Standing for Truth. Uh, that's a good ministry. And uh, Utah Christian. Oh, here it is. Oh, see? Laura, you are awesome. Okay. The Utah Christian Research Center is um, 579 Galena Park place suite 101 so somebody's gonna have to put that up there on the calendar where it's gonna be i I mean nine o'clock in the morning that to me is like are you serious i don't get up till 10 30 see i was was up till four o'clock last night because i can't i have trouble sleeping i do i have trouble sleeping and uh just what it is my brother does too um i think it's just a genetic thing and so um i I have to uh you know i I, I can't go to sleep at one o'clock in the morning. I just lay there for two hours. Oh, now Andrew Rappaport, we've roomed together, done stuff. He's out in two minutes. Makes me mad. You know, I just want to throw some something at him. You know, wake him up. I'm looking. You know, I'm just a, pretend I'm asleep or something. So, uh, anyway, all right, there we go. Hey, you want to give me a call? Eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six. Let's get to Seth from Charlotte, North Carolina. Seth, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, so I had a question about the book of Nahum. I'm probably butchering that word. Um, Nahum, but I, I just wanted to know. I just wanted to know exactly what he's talking about in his vision, um, and really what the what the book is about. I, I I read through it, and I'm just. I guess I'm kind of confused. I'm I'm not not really understanding <laughs> what exactly he's talking about. What he, what it's about. Oh, um, well, you know, I'd have to do a little bit of research on top of my head. I can't tell you. Let's see if I can do this, though. Nahum. And usually there's a little intros uh, in commentaries, so I can just go there and take a look. Uh, it offers an illustrative case study on how difficult it can be. Oh, <laughs> that's about dating prophets. So uh, let's get a bit more information, dating, writing, character. What's it about? Oh, I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do. I know where to get the information some from. So there's always resources, always resources. One of the, by the way, one of the things I want to do uh, is uh, do a brief outline of each book of the Bible. That's 66 books. Uh, so that's what it is. What? Okay. The, uh, okay, there we go. There we go. And so... It's just another project, which I want to do. So uh, it's, okay, it's a short book consisting of three chapters, and it contains uh, mm-hmm. poetic language, and it describes the downfall of Nineveh. Yeah, that's right, because it says in the very beginning there. So it's about the impending judgment and destruction of, of Nineveh and God's mm-hmm. justice and things like that. That's basically what it's about, okay? Yeah, I... um. So I yeah so I read through that but it's it's also a a vision into the future am I am I wrong about that I don't know I you know I'd like to be able to say I have good answers for every question but sometimes I just don't know so <laughs> that's all right 
and it says record the vision and uh, this is an oh that's Habakkuk so what I'm looking for in Nahum yeah the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite and uh, so okay what particular verse in it is uh, making you think that it might be a, a prophetic thing in that sense well, honestly, I, I I read through it and then I watched a, a video on an older gentleman on YouTube describing that it was also a vision of him seeing into the future. Um, of what was the name of this guy? Gosh, I cannot remember. I I really don't. I don't remember. Okay. I just saw it one day, okay. clicked on it. Um, yeah, because sometimes there's bad teachers. I'm not saying it's good or bad. But uh, yeah. as I'm looking through and scanning, it's uh, it's your fortica- uh, fortic- fortification. This case, you'll become drunk, Egypt. You are no better than no. Than no I, I'd have to look at the whole thing to see what's going on. It mentions Ethiopia, sure. Lubim, and do a uh, a study on it. So uh, it might be. I, I don't know. I, I just have to take a look and see. I wish I had a better answer. I really do. But. Uh, that's all right. Um, I, I have, a, have, I have another question, if, if that's okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. I think it's First Corinthians. Maybe maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. But um, it's where Paul is talking about women speaking in the church. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and this is actually Timothy. something I, I asked, I asked my uh, pastor about. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I, I, I think most people interpret that wrong as in saying that women cannot be um, cannot speak in the church I, I don't know I guess I'm just kind of on the fence about it on um, how I should be interpreting that um, okay so what's going on is that biblically speaking women are not to be pastors elders or deacons because the Bible and I can give you the verses and the references talks about that and, and I think it's in First Corinthians, early part of 14, I think it is, or maybe not. Um, it talks about, uh, no, it's not in there. It's uh, about being uh, heads being ve- uh, veiled, and women yeah. cannot you know, speak and things like that. So th- this is a difficult area of Scripture. So what do they think is going on? So one of the options, it's First Corinthians 11, one of the options, let me go through it a little bit. See, Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. So it's talking about order. This is verse 3. And we have to understand that even in the Trinity, there's a hierarchy. The Father sent the Son, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. So, and there's more, but that's just a quick example. So it says that Jesus, the head of, of Christ, is, is God, speaking of the Father. So it doesn't mean that they are inferior or the Christ is inferior. It means there's a hierarchical structure for order because this is the nature of the Trinitarian existence. This is how it's been. So the Word is eternally the Son, eternally begotten, in the sense that, not that he had a beginning in that sense, but that in the eternal covenant, he was always the one who would be sent, become one of us, die for our sins. So he's always in that context of the one who is sent. Now we've got a break, but I, and we'll get back after this. But I want to lay down that this is because of the Trinitarian uh, essence itself. When we get back from the break, we'll talk about that. Okay, so hold on, okay? Hey, folks, if you want to call me, we have two open lines, 877-207-2276. We'll be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, we have two open lines, 877-207-2276. Let's get to Seth from Charlotte. Seth, you still there? Hello. I don't know if we're hearing him or not. Yep, I'm here. Okay, there you go. Good. All right, so I laid out the issue of the Trinity and its hierarchical structure because when, when I go through the rest of this, I want people to have a theological basis to understand that authority does not mean superiority or that you're better than somebody else. 
It has to do with the very nature and the Trinitarian communion itself. Because in the Trinity, that's the origination of all things. In Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, you know, in the beginning God said, let there be light. So, uh, or one three, And so God is the one who, who he created everything, and he's the one who is the originator, and all things go back to him. At any rate, so check this out. So in uh, 1 Corinthians 11.5, but every woman uh, who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and same with the woman who has her head shaved. In the culture, a woman's shaved head was a sign of uh, sexual infidelity and adultery, and sometimes also of prostitution. So the hair was a glory uh, for the woman. And in my opinion, I love to see women with long hair. I just think it's feminine. I think it's it's great. I think that's when women look best. Old gray hair, long old gray hair. I, I love that as well as young. That's just my opinion. But I think it's most beautiful. All right. So not a big deal. But when in that culture too, if um, if a woman were to let her hair down in public, that was a scandal because women were uh, guarded. They weren't possessions, not like that, but they were guarded very specifically. Women weren't supposed to go out on their own unless they were in a group with other women or accompanied by a man because a lot of guys out there were pretty bad. And if you were going out there by yourself, were you advertising something? Why were you out by yourself? So it coincidentally, a little bit, I'll tell you about this. When the woman at the well went out by herself and Jesus met her, it's a little scandalous because now he's meeting a woman who's by herself at a well. And I've actually drank out of that very well, as a matter of fact. But she had had five husbands and she was an outcast of the community. So she had to go to the well later on in the heat of the day by herself. And Jesus met her there and talked to her. Okay, so she would have her hair covered. That's what it was supposed to be the case. Now, in uh, oh, where is it? Luke 7 where the woman came in to the Pharisee's house, Simon, when Jesus was there and she let her hair down and wiped his feet with her hair. Oh, that's, that's scandal. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, that, that's incredible. Why would a woman let her hair down like that in public? Because she's only supposed to do that with her husband. This is the culture. So if a woman did that in public, she's advertising her sexuality. You don't do that. This is the culture of that time. And um, so that's why he, Paul says she's the one and the same as the one whose head is shaved. Because there's a cultural act there. So what's going on is a spiritual act is to be under authority. So notice what it says in 1 Corinthians eleven five. Her head is uncovered. Uh, that everyone who ha every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is worn the same with the woman who has her head shaved. So what it's telling me is that the specificity of praying and prophesying means in the church she can pray publicly and she can prophesy publicly. Because the Holy Spirit is working through all people, not just the men. But when the women mm -hmm. do this, they're to cover their heads because it's a symbol of the authority that they are recognizing. It's not that they're inferior or have to do what the men say. That's not it. It's the recognizing the authority that is established by God and uh, through the church system. And he says in verse 7, For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man, because his direct authority is under Jesus, under God, but the woman's authority is under the man. So the hair covering symbolized the authority she had to her under her husband, which is one of the reasons she would cover her hair like that. So her head covered, so her hair generally was covered. They would go into a place in a meeting, and they might see a little bit of hair or whatever, but they would cover their heads because that was uh, a symbol of that authority. And so that's what's going on basically there. And it's a, it's a tough area of Scripture to uh, interpret uh, very clearly and stuff. Does that help at all? Yeah. Yeah, um, I just, I kind of can't wrap my head around it. And so I, when I asked my pastor this uh, about women preaching in the church, so he he went on to say the con that the context is really important 
and the temple setting was divided between men and women, one on one side and one on the other. There was yes. a situation where arguments and disruptions were occurring to that setting, and That's Paul true. was directly addressing that situation and addressing that particular body yes. or group. And then he went on to write in Galatians three twenty eight through twenty nine. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your, your you pastor all, blew you're it. You're all one in Christ. Yeah, he blew it. What's that? Okay, and he, he blew it. He made a mistake. Okay, I'll explain why. So he's correct about the issue. Generally, the women sat in the back, the men sat in the front. The women now had new freedom in Christianity. Hey, honey, what did he say? Because there was no loudspeakers. They would go up in the front. The man would set up, stand up, and, and or sit and preach. And so they would keep quiet. Do this under your authority of your husband. He'll tell you at home. All right. So to go to, to, okay, about women pastors and elders, they are not to be pastors and elders. It is sinful for them to be pastors and elders. The Bible clearly says they're not to be. When people go to Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ. See, now they can preach. That's not what it's talking about. There's neither Jew nor uh, Greek, uh, slave or free, neither male nor female. Uh, you're all one in Christ. What he's talking about here is being saved. Because before, uh, in Galatians, remember in Galatians, they're talking, Paul's writing in refutation of the issue of the Judaizers were saying you've got to be circumcised to be saved. A lot of Jews there. And the Jews believed, no, oh, God only came for the Jewish people, not for everybody. But in Christ, there's either male nor female, Jew, Greek, they're all, you know, slave or female. They're all one in Christ. That's what's going on. You can't take that, rip it out of its context and say, now women can be pastors and elders. Well, if that's the case, then I guess women aren't women, are they? Because there's neither male nor female, right? So then can we use all the same bathroom then? Because how far is this going to go? So your pastor, if he's using that verse to say that women can be pastors and elders, he flat out blew it, and I'd tell it to his face, politely, with respect, but he's wrong. And I can mm. show you why if you want. I can explain where the scriptures clearly, absolutely forbid women from preaching and teaching, if you want. Okay, so it's up to you. Sure. All right, so First Timothy 2, 12 and 13. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but remain quiet, for Adam was first created and uh, then Eve. So Paul is tying this into the created order. It's First Timothy 2, 12 and 13. When it says she's to be quiet, it's the Greek word hesukia, which means keep it down. It doesn't mean absolute silence. And uh, when we get back, I'll explain a few more verses and then we'll move along. Okay, so hold on, buddy. There's a break. We'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Bottom of the hour, if you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. All right. You still there, Seth? Yep. All right. So Paul has said he does not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority, but to remain silent. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is go to, I'm going to go to uh, 1 Timothy 517. First Timothy 517. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So the elders, some of them work hard at preaching and teaching. So a preacher is by default an elder, right? Does that make sense? Real mm -hmm. simple. Now, in First Timothy 3, verse 2, Paul says an overseer, that's the Greek word episkopos, episcopalian, episkopos, it's a bishop or, or overseer, then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, anermias gunaikos, husband of one wife is what it says in the Greek, temperate, prudent, respectable. This is what Timothy, it's what he's writing to Timothy, but there's one more thing I want to bring out in Timothy. In 1 Timothy 3.15, he says, Paul says, in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So Paul is giving Timothy instructions on how you're to do stuff in the church. And in the church, the elders 
uh, are, are the pastors are elders. Women are not to be in authority over the men. And the overseer is to be uh, the husband of one wife. Now, when we go to Titus, this is where Paul is writing to Titus. He says, for this reason I left you in Crete, this is verse 5 and 6, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city, uh, cities I directed. Remember, a pastor is an elder, okay? Appoint elders. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Well, how does a, uh, how, do, how does a woman feel that? How does a woman meet that need, right? It doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. And so, He goes on and he says, for the overseer must be above reproach. So now Paul ties overseer with elder. So the overseer, the elder, we can say functionally for now, is the same office. And they must be husband of one wife with children who believe. Now this is normative. So what if a man's wife dies? Can he no longer be an elder? That's not what the point is. What if he only has one child, not two, children who believe? Uh, well, that doesn't mean he can't be an elder. What's going on here is that Paul is giving the normative requirements. And in every instance, it's male. He must be the husband of one wife. So he's got to be a man because the Bible says so. That's what's going on. And in Greek, furthermore, nouns have gender. They can be masculine, feminine, or neuter. Like That's like Spanish. Okay, and... Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can have different words in in, uh, in in different languages have gender, and it's the same thing in Spanish, in uh, Greek. Well, elders as is presbuteroi, which is plural, nominative, um, masculine, and that's the word that's used. And so, you know, and then it says men, anthropoi, which is a plural, masculine, uh, nominative, sub means which means subject. That that's what's going on. Okay, so. Women can't be pastors and elders. And one more last bit. I know I'm long-winded here. I did research on this. And I've written a lot on it. And I, I and I have an open standing debate challenge to anybody who wants to have a public debate with me. I'll go to your church as long as it's uh, live uh, online and or we can, you know, have it filmed. Uh, does the mm-hmm. Bible support women pastors and elders? I've been offering this challenge for 20 years. And not a single a person has ever taken me up on it. I don't want a pastor to do this. Why is that? Because they know I'm going to go to the scriptures. They know. I'll go straight there. I'm going to put them on the, on the spot. So anyway, in my research of denominations that adopted women pastors and elders, within two generations, 80% started approving of homosexuality. Okay? Mm. All right? Yeah, that. That, that clears it up a lot for me. I appreciate that very much. Okay. I've written a lot on this. This is a big issue. And the reason it's a big issue is not because women are bad, men are good. That's not it. It's because men have a tendency to become lazy when enabled to become lazy. When women step up and do a man's job, men tend to sit down and do nothing. And mm-hmm. In this culture where masculinity is under attack and femininity is the way, the truth, and the life, men all the more don't want to risk anything because biblically they're not sure how to be men. And I can teach them biblically what it means. Not that I'm a great example of it, but biblically we follow Christ and we aren't supposed to be afraid of what your wife says, or your friends say, or your boss says. You must be wise in all these things, but we're to stand up for truth, even if it costs us. And men are more and more afraid to stand up and be men. And they're more concerned with what everybody thinks about them, and uh, unfortunately, what kind of clothes they're wearing, what kind of car they're driving, etc. You know? Okay? Got anything else? I don't think so. I think I think we we cleared it all up. I appreciate it very much. All right. 
Good. Ask your pastor to call me if he wants. We can have a discussion on it. You can go to CARM. You can look up the women pastor stuff that's there. But if he says women can be pastors and elders, he is wrong. And I would not trust him to properly uh, understand the Word of God. It's very simple. Okay? All right. I appreciate it, Matt. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. All right. Now, sorry for the long wait, Clarice. Sorry, a whole half hour you've been waiting. Um, Thank you for waiting. So what do you got? Um, oh, you're welcome, and amen to what you all just said to that gentleman. That was really good. I agree with you. Um, okay. So I have a couple of things I want to ask you, and hopefully I won't take up all your time, but so be it. And so uh, my question is, I was talking with someone Saturday evening, and um, they said to me, well, let me just preface this by saying I've been a born again Christian for almost forty three years, and I am I don't have your mind. I don't have the years of study that you've done as far as everything that you've done. I highly respect you for I've I heard your story of all the school and studying and all that you've done. I admire you for that, and I listen because um, I know you know what you're talking about. I don't think anybody has a coin on God's market, but I think that you know what you're talking about, and I love and respect you for that. That's why I call you to ask you certain things. And well, um, I don't, I don't have the recall that I used to call. I'm older; uh, my recall is not good, but I know God's word, and I Amen. study it all the time and read it all the time. And um, so I was talking with this person, and they said to me that Muslims believe in the same God that we do, that Mm -hmm. they believe in the same God. They just don't believe in Jesus, but they believe in the same God. And I said, well, Jesus is God, so how can they believe in the same God? So I'd like to ask you your response to what you would have said to that. I'd say... No, they don't believe in the same God. And I'll say, let me explain something. God is a trinity. And the trinity is one God in three distinct simultaneous persons. And in Islam, they openly deny the trinity. Openly deny it. All right? They do. Mm -hmm. And this is Surah 573 in the Quran. They do blaspheme who say Allah is one of three in a trinity for there is no God except one of Allah. Now, this proves they don't understand what the Trinity is, but they use the word Trinity, and they call it blasphemy. So we cannot, this is simple logic. If something Mm -hmm. is what it is, then it has certain properties and characteristics to it. So God being a triune being means that God has one essence, and that essence is triune. In Islam, God has one Mm -hmm. essence, and the essence is singular. And so they cannot be the same. In Christianity, uh, Islam, I mean, it's Christianity, God is three distinct simultaneous persons. In Islam, that's not who God is. In Christianity, the second person of the Godhead became flesh. That's denied in Islam. So they do not affirm the same God. The God of Islam is pagan, is the moon God, and it is not a true God, and Islam is a false religion. Okay. That's exactly what I told him, but he was very argu- he's a very argumentative person, and it was very tiring to talk to him. And I'm like, you know, I'm done wow. here. But anyway, yeah, that, yeah, you're good for yeah, you. After but he was a while, wrong. there's just like, I, hey, I hold, know. we got a break, Clarice. We got a break. Hold on, Clarice. We'll, get, we'll be I'll right back. On. Okay, we're right back after these messages. We'll get on here with Clarice again, and please stay tuned. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. Clarice, are you still there? Yes, sir, I am. Thank you. All right. Um, Can I ask another question, please? You sure can. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. 
do you believe that a person can be a practicing Catholic and be a true born again Christian? No. No. Official okay. Catholic theology is Antichrist. And so official anti official Roman Catholic theology curses the gospel and it says, for example, in uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2068, it says that you, you attain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. In paragraph 2036, mm-hmm. it says that keeping the natural law is necessary for salvation. And paragraph 2070 says that the Ten Commandments are an express representation of the natural law. So keeping the Ten Commandments is necessary for, to obtain salvation. So it mm-hmm. teaches a false gospel because it doesn't teach justification by faith alone in Christ alone. And it curses the gospel by saying that those who would teach that believe that are, are wrong. Furthermore, it promotes idolatry in its worship and adoration of Mary. You bow down to Mary and believe Mary can do things that only God can do. So they attribute to the created thing uh, that which belongs to God alone. So they, the Roman Catholic Church uh, also turns uh, grace into a work and it turns grace into a work mm-hmm. by uh, saying in order to get God's grace though he doesn't owe it to you here's the procedure you go to the the uh, you go through it's called sacerdotalism where the priest has the authority to administer the grace of God that is accessed by the Catholic Church and it's in heaven this this treasury of merit is in heaven and the, the Catholic Church has access to it And so it divvies it out according to what it says people are to do. So it turns grace into a work. It is, uh, it's a horrible uh, false religion. Okay. Well, that's what I thought, but I have a friend that um, told me recently that she was saved under a Catholic priest who uh, practiced the gifts of the spirit and was not a Mm -hmm. typical Catholic priest. Yep. And he led her to a place to where that she had to die to self and accept Christ, and that's what she did. Amen. So when I, what I was hearing was, it's I, 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 I did this, I did this. It's, I didn't hear, mm. let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Yeah. That could just be an issue so, of sanctification. But it's possible mm-hmm. that there are Catholic priests who really are born again, and they stay there in order to uh, witness to people and get them saved in the Catholic Church. I know that mm-hmm. that is the case. I've heard that there are Catholics, priests, who become born again, and they know the Catholic Church is false, but they stay there, do stuff, and witness. And they're evangelists. It's not very common, but I've heard that. So maybe you know he's a guy who's really saved. I don't know. But what I do when yeah. I talk to them is I say, look, let me ask you some questions. Are we saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? And they, you know, well, mm-hmm. no. Okay, well, that's what I want to know. And uh, sometimes I'll say yes, and I still have to ask more questions to clarify. You know, and they'll say, we have to do good works. I say, for what reason? To prove to God that you're saved? He already knows. He saved you. What are the works for? Well, if you don't have works, you don't have true faith. That's correct. That's what James talks about. But it's not the works that save you. And then they go in and, right. and it gets more so. So, yeah, yeah. And um, my notes it's, it's, on it's Calvinism not, are, are about 191 pages. But anyway, go ahead. Is oh great! I'd love to read. Yes, yeah, I'd love to read that. But um, <laughs> do you have on your website? Do you have some um, what you said referring to the Catholics? What you were talking about your beliefs and what you have found to be true, and also. What you said about Muslims, like the response to that, like a, like points on your your website that I could look at and just read it for myself. On, on Islam, absolutely. We have if okay. you go to Karm, my website, and you go to the the mm-hmm. uh, the left menu, pull it down, you'll see uh, religions, and I have stuff on. I've written about over hundred, I think hundred and forty, fifty articles on Catholicism, hundred and forty or fifty on on Islam, and so there's lots of stuff there. But if you don't want to okay. uh, to do what I do, which is you know become mentally anal retentive and write forever, and you don't want to go through all those articles, you can just scan through, see which ones you want to read. You can also do something much easier, and that's go to. It's real easy to do. Carm dot org, c a r m dot org forward slash c u t. 
cut. And that's for cut and paste. Just the word cut. And what it'll do is it'll mm-hmm. take you to uh, shortened versions of stuff. And, you, and there's Roman Catholicism there. And you can go there. And then there's also stuff on Islam. And so it's like, it's, it's just oh, it's stuff so it's that calm, I use for. Calm.org. Mm-hmm. That's Sorry. my website. It's yeah, calm.org okay. yeah. forward slash cut. C-U-T, yep. And it'll take you to the, okay. uh, the, we call it a second level page that has a list of things. Abortion, atheism, COVID, homosexuality, Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, Oneness Theology, Relativism, Roman Catholicism, Slavery, and stuff like that. And there's a little bit more. Okay. And I, I developed it so well, I can copy and point. cut and paste. I'm sorry, what? Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to give a shout out to something uh, you were, the other listener was referring to, and you said you'd like to do this. I, I know a, uh, a Bible teacher. He used to pastor, but he's also a Hebrew scholar that I have lots of respect for him. And he does, he lived in Israel for many years, and mm-hmm. he teaches and he does teaching tours. But he has, and I'd just love for you to look at it, he's Dr. Randall Smith, but okay. it's called One Hour, One Book. Okay? okay. And some, Interesting. He send goes me the information. The whole Bible. Just brief them yeah. Out. Sir? Yeah, send it to me. What did uh, you say? We have, yeah, send, send me the information, and mm-hmm. I'll check it out. Did they email it to you, mean? Yeah. At the bottom of the website, okay. there's an email address, info at karm.org. And that's the way to do it because I have so okay. many things going on that if it's not sent to me, I'll forget it. Okay. I'm sure. I'm sure. And listen, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you. God bless you. All right. Well, God bless Clarice. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, so believe it or not, there's a friend of mine on in one of the chat things. I don't know which room where he is, Dave Sherman. I'm going to just say his name because he and I grew up together. Uh, I was 12 years old. I've known him since I was 12. <laughs> so I've known him for, uh, let's see, 55 years. So uh, he said, I didn't call him on his birthday. Yes, I did. <laughs> Let the phone ring for a full minute. And uh, it never picked up. So there you go. I'm just giving a shout out. All right, let's get to Dudley from Oklahoma. That's another long wait. Hey, Dudley, welcome. You're on the air. Dudley, well, maybe we lost him because. Oh, sorry. I think the name got the name was wrong. <laughs> oh, it was. What, what's so your real name, name then? Yeah, the name is incorrect. Braden. Your, your name is incorrect. That's a weird name. Yeah, the name the name is incorrect. Uh, my name is Braden. That's what oh, happened. Okay. There. So I didn't. <laughs> All right, Braden. unmute myself. Okay, it's all right. But, uh, thank you, Matt, for uh, taking my taking the call and taking the question. And uh, my question is in regards to uh, part of Calvinism about predestination. Okay. And um, my question is is in Mark chapter four when Jesus is explaining um, the purpose of the parables, and he says in uh, chapter four, starting at verse uh, fifteen, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And my question to you. What, from a reform perspective, how would you go about answering someone that says, well, would that not be the instrumental means behind how God keeps that person from being saved? Because personally, I've struggled with combating that issue. Well, it's interesting you said it keeps him from being saved as though he he's going to get saved and God's stopping it. That's that's not the reform perspective. Right. It's not a biblical perspective. So right. I'm not sure if you just kind of misspoke it. But, right. Um, so this is a parable, yeah. and parables are meant to under, to illustrate usually one main point, and uh, not always, and uh, some sub points, and they're they're generic. Like think of them as really cool wisdom statements. And so in this parable, the sower goes out, and he is going to lay some. I wonder if I did a, did an analysis on this. I'm curious, because I do. I've done a whole section on parables. Uh, but I did them so long ago, I can't remember if I did it on this. Let me see if I've got this parable of the sower. I'm going to the parables. And uh, I don't see it. There we go, parables. So, um, parable, oh, anyway, I, I don't know. So it doesn't matter. So when, when he says uh, that the, the devil comes and, and takes away the seed, 
what he's, he's not saying that this is thwarting God's effort. God can say whoever he wants. Right. What Jesus is doing is talking right. about the different kinds of evangelism, the different kinds of people, the different kinds of, so to speak, beliefs. Not that they're true beliefs. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to say something here because this exact issue is the last issue that I, of any significance that I'm wrestling with in Reformed theology. Because it's something like this. And I, every now and then I think about it. Now, wait a minute. If God is going to grant people faith, Philippians 1.29, and that faith is in Christ, John 6.29, right. then how is it that Jesus would be saying, well, they're going to believe, not quite, the devil takes it away. Does that mean they were going to believe and not because the devil stopped it? That seems to be what's going to be the case. Well, does that mean then that uh, that they were going to believe on their own? Well, that can't happen because we know Jesus says, you can't come to me unless it's granted to you from the Father, John 6, 65. Uh, so, yep. or, or does it mean that in God's sovereignty, he's working through the varying kinds of appearances of, of people who are looking at Christianity, believing in the truth, because there are appearances of it how they look and there's but there's some, a degree of actuality that occurs in their hearts and jesus is addressing this kind of a thing so what i conclude is with stuff like this is that there is a responsibility that we people have as humans and i haven't figured out logically ontologically scripturally how to work that into the trinitarian eternal essence okay I, i'm working on that. i'm not getting very far and so what I do is I say, well, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't know how it works, but something's there. But at the same time, God works through that. So it's like four rocks, you know, four levels that are being spoken of, and God weaves His way through them and brings about exactly what He wants when He wants. And so, what Jesus is doing is explaining things on the human level, with a little hint of the divine or the spiritual, and uh, that God is sovereign, and He's just talking about that to the believers to the people around him actually early on the covenant people okay awesome well i appreciate that and there's um if i can there's one more question that i would like sure. to ask you and you got 30 seconds that is so with okay awesome with the doctrines of grace one of the things i've struggled with is i felt like over the time of studying them i believe them but they have wrecked like havoc kind of in my mind where either i'm focusing too much on them or i'm never content with the limited knowledge that I have with them. Whoa. Okay, dude. So I would right ask for any, any you gotta, advice. You got to call okay. me back. Okay, we're not hearing the music because I had a sound yeah. problem. You call me back tomorrow. We'll talk. Okay, buddy. Yeah. You call yes, me sir. back. Will All do. Right. Thank you, man. I really appreciate right. that. Okay. All right. So uh, I think uh, we are off right now. Oh, no, there's the music. Oh, it came back a little bit later than usual. Another program powered by the Truth Network. <laughs>